this morning I want to share with you out of the book of Romans, which is a letter that the Apostle Paul writes to the early church to help them understand the context of God's divine calling. And in Romans 9, the, the Apostle Paul shares a story using Jacob and Esau as an example of God's sovereign prerogative to choose whomever he would so desire and in doing so birth great things through their life. In Romans 9, starting in verse 10, this is what the Bible says. When Isaac married Rebekah, she gave birth to twins. But before they was born, before they had done anything, good or bad, she received a message from God. And this message shows that God chooses people according to his own purposes. <laughs> It would be easy to read Romans 9 and not understand the context. When Isaac married Rebecca, she gave birth to twins. It's almost like supernaturally on the day that they was married, she gave birth. But that's not actually how the story unfolds. It would be 20 years of praying before Isaac and Rebecca were able to conceive. It's interesting when you read scripture, you pick up on themes and patterns. Abraham and Sarah struggled with infertility. Isaac and Rebekah struggle with infertility. Jacob and Rachel struggle with infertility. Hannah, the mother of Samuel, struggles with infertility. Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, struggles with infertility. It is almost as if nothing of significance is birthed in the earth without struggle. It's almost as if you ought to keep praying when life is most difficult because God never leaves a story halfway done. It's almost as if there is a war over the next generation, both biologically and spiritually. And unless we contend in prayer, we run the risk of not seeing in fullness that which God so desires to do. And here's the good news of the gospel. You didn't choose God. He chose you. No, you didn't find God. He found you. And here's the good news. Anything that God finds never goes missing again. God found you on the streets. God found you in the strip club. God found you in the middle of your divorce. God held you in the middle of your abuse. God healed you in the middle of your disease. God forgave you in the middle of your brokenness. No, your relationship with God has never been about what you can provide for him. It has always been about what he has provided for you. I was preaching last week at the Seattle campus. And God put it on my heart just to begin to prophesy. And I said, oh, I see it in my spirit this evening. There's a young man here tonight. You're struggling with suicide and self-harm. It's running your family. You've been in a dark place. You're oppressed at night with terrible nightmares. You're far from God. But tonight, God is chasing you. We made a call to the altar at the end of service. But I didn't see at the altar who I knew was in the room by my spirit. <laughs> so after we got done praying for folks in the altar, I was kind of scanning the crowd and I saw a young man, maybe a freshman or a sophomore at UW. He was sitting in the back, had a backpack on. I could tell he didn't want to leave service, but he also didn't want to come forward for prayer. And I thought to myself, no worries, I can travel. So I walked down the stage. I walked to the back row. I put my arm around this young man. I said, my name's Russ. Can I pray for you? He said, yes. And I began to lay my hands on him and God began to download into my life with prophetic accuracy and discernment the details that he was dealing with. As I begun to pray for him, he began to weep and shake under the power of the Almighty. After I got done praying, I said, young man, what's God doing in your life? And he said, pastor, it was me. I was the one that you was talking about. I was the one that you was prophesying about. I grew up in church, but I'm a prodigal and I'm far from God. And tonight I want to come home. And I looked him in the eyes and I said, young man, God has chosen you. Now, 
Now watch what Jesus says in John 15. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. <laughs> See, God chooses people according to his own purposes. So that begs the question, what is the purpose of God for your life? And Jesus answers this question in John 15, that you should bear fruit, that that fruit would remain, so that whatever you ask the Father in the name of his Son, he may give you. Yeah, Romans 9 says, before you was born, before you ever had the chance to do anything good or bad, before you could ever make a conscious decision or formulate a coherent sentence, God chose you for his own purpose. Why does the unborn baby have value? Because the calling of God doesn't start after you are born, it starts while you're still in the womb. Why does the unborn baby have value? Because God's purpose takes precedence over a person's choice. While you were in the womb, God was establishing your future. He was imparting gifts and anointings and God himself was downloading dreams into your heart and vision into your spirit. It's interesting. In 2011, scientists observed an odd phenomenon, and it was this. When a human sperm cell makes contact with an egg, there is an unexplainable flash of light that occurs as a result. Oh, they may not understand it, but I think we do. See, the universe began with a declaration, let there be and the miracle of life begins with that same command. Let there be light. I believe that that flash of light, that act of conception, is the moment by which a spirit, a soul, and a body are brought together with divine purpose as the result of God making a choice. Hear me, friend. You may have been unplanned, but you are not a mistake. You didn't somehow get on the wrong bus and find yourself at pursuit this morning. God has led you to this very moment for this particular purpose. And even if it doesn't quite all make sense to you, God has got you right where he wants you. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. <laughs> now watch what Paul says in verse 12. God calls people, not according to their good or bad works, for even Rebekah was told, your older son, which is Esau, will serve your younger son, who is Isaac. <laughs> Hear me, friend. There is no first or second to God because he is not bound by the limitations of time, space, or order. The world said Esau is first, but God said Jacob is chosen. When I'm chosen, I don't need to be first. When I'm chosen, I don't need to be loud. When I'm chosen, I don't need to be next. I don't need to be noticed. I don't need to be promoted. I don't need to be praised. When I'm chosen, I can rest assured that the favor and anointing that God has placed on my life, it'll open every door, it'll pay every bill, and it will establish every step that I take. Are you feeling overlooked this morning? Relax. You've been chosen, and that's enough. See, the word chosen in the Greek is eklektos. It's where we get the English word election. It means personally selected by God for the rendering of special service unto him. Hear me, when God elects, there is no recounts because the race isn't even close. When God chooses, there isn't a debate, there isn't a negotiation. When God stamps a person, a people, a church, or a region with his holy intention, there ain't no demon in hell or power on earth that can stop yeah. our God. Can you imagine if your relationship with God was dependent on your own ability to be good? You would literally lose before you even started. Hebrews 9 says it was by his own blood. Isaiah 53 says it was by his own stripes. Galatians 3 says it was by his own death. Ephesians 1 says it was by his own spirit. Do you know what I contributed to the salvation process? Sin. But today, I have victory in Jesus. 
He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me before I knew him and all my love is due him. Oh friend, he plunged us to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Abraham lied. Sarah mocked. Moses stuttered. Hosea's wife was a hooker. Jacob was a liar. David had an affair. Solomon was too rich. Jesus was too poor. Isaac was too old. David was too young. Peter was too fearful. Naomi was a widow. Paul was a murderer. Jonah was a prodigal. Miriam was a gossip. Thomas was a doubter. Jeremiah was depressed. Elijah was burnt out. John the Baptist was a loudmouth. Martha was a worry wart. Noah got drunk and Lazarus was dead. And yet God used them all. So what's your excuse? See, God chooses people, not according to their good or bad works, but instead according to his own sovereign purposes. See, God gets the most glory from the messiest circumstances. And if your journey don't require grace, it ain't a journey of faith. <laughs> Hear me, friend, you must offload the anxiety related to not being where you want to be today. I should be further in my career. I should be more advanced in my spiritual development. My finances should be greater. My kids should be better. My clock is ticking. My options are running out. My future is looking bleak. No, the God that you serve causes the sun to stand still in order to intervene on behalf of his people. The God you serve says one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. The God you serve causes the barren to rejoice, the desert to prosper, the orphan to be adopted, and the dead to live. The God that you serve created time. Therefore, God doesn't serve time. Time serves him. And when he says it's time, there ain't no devil in hell that can stop what God intends. I heard the Lord say it this week. As I was reading scripture, I felt the spirit of the Lord speak to my spirit. Russell, it's time. I said, God, it's time for what? We just opened Seattle. He said, I, I know you just opened Seattle, but what seems impossible to man is possible to God. So it's time for another one. I said, God, we just announced the Easter event. He said, yeah, but it's time to dream bigger. I said, God, we just saw another family get saved. He said, yeah, but it's time to cast the net again. And in verse 13, Paul says something that appears controversial until you understand it. Just as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. See, this is often a misunderstood verse. The concept being unpacked in Romans 9 is that God chose Jacob, God blessed Jacob, God promoted Jacob, God preferred Jacob, and through him, a nation called Israel would be birthed. And when God makes a choice, hear me, it overcomes every objection of man. Listen, the calling of God is not fair. The anointing of God is not fair. The election of God is not fair. Stop trying to figure it out. God raises up and he puts down. God is less interested in humanity's definition of fairness and more interested in the world's need for redemption. And here's the good news of the new covenant. Through Christ, we have all been chosen. Just like Jacob was chosen so many thousands of years ago. Let me prove it to you. Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, he has predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ himself. Do you believe in Jesus? Good. That means you've been chosen. Have your sins been forgiven? Good. That means you've been chosen. You don't have to play the guessing game today. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, will be chosen, and will be redeemed. I wish 
I had the time to recount all the mistakes of Jacob because I'm sure it would be of great encouragement to you today. He convinces his brother Esau to sell his birthright. He steals his father's blessing. He runs away from his family like a coward. And that brings us all the way to Genesis 32. Jacob has been on the run for 20 years. And finally, after all this time, his past is getting ready to catch up. And Jacob catches wind that Esau is coming after him with 400 men. And in great fear and distress, Jacob cries out to the Lord in Genesis 32, starting in verse 10. And watch what Jacob says. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me. But God... You have said, I will surely make you prosper. I will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. See, friend, every journey of faith starts out with this honest realization. God, I am unworthy. I don't deserve this. I can't earn this. But in your kindness and your faithfulness, will you remember your promises? Will you save my family? And will you prosper my offspring? You don't get breakthrough until you're willing to be honest because God can't heal what you fake. I have tried in my own power. I have attempted to manufacture my own blessing. It looks like Esau's gonna kill me and I probably deserve it, but God, I am reminded of what you have said and if I ever needed help, it's now. Watch how the story unfolds. Verse 22 that night, Jacob got up and he took his wives, his female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed the Jabbok River. So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. <laughs> and theologians refer to this as a Christophany. It means this, a manifestation of Christ in the Old Testament prior to the Incarnation. The man that Jacob was wrestling with wasn't just any ordinary angel. He was wrestling with God himself from evening until daybreak. Oh, this is a strange idea. With one command from his voice, God created the galaxies, and yet Jacob wrestles with God throughout the night. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't used to understand this verse until I got older in my faith. And I have remembered all of the nights, even over the last few months, where I have wrestled with God all evening, often without sleep, contending for the promises that he has made. And here is what I have come to realize. God invites us into the struggle to develop the deep things of our heart. Because friends, some ideas, some dreams, some visions are so deep inside of you that the only way that they rise to the surface is through the construct of conflict. Oh, I'm not wrestling with God to try and change his opinion. I'm not arguing with God in an effort to eke out a blessing, but God invites us to contend in order to demonstrate his sovereign prerogative. See, the apostle Paul says it this way, I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of for me. That term lay hold in the Greek means this, to arrest, to capture, to seize or to aggressively take. Yeah, I think about this in the context of prayer and petition. And when God gives you a promise, there are seasons by which you go to war, contending for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. You ever have a kid far from God? You go to war. You ever have a loved one on death's door? You go to war. You ever been dealing with a demonic principality and power? You go to war. I would venture to say as a church, we have been invited to go to war for the region and this fight will not be won by dead faith or lukewarm believers. No, I've been invited to hang on to the hem of his garment until virtue flows from him into me and I'm not letting go until every one of his promises is made manifest in and through the influence of his ever expanding kingdom. 
And when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint. The man said, let me go for it is daybreak. And Jacob replied, I will not let go unless you bless me. The man replied, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. So Jacob called that place Peniel, saying it is because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. <laughs> Where is the generation of people who will say even when it's difficult, even when it's tough, even when it's grueling, even when I feel overlooked, even when I don't understand, I am not leaving without a blessing, even if it takes me all night to receive. See, victory belongs to the persistent. Blessing belongs to the stubborn. If you feel like you've been fighting just to stay afloat, God sent me here this morning to tell you, don't give up because God's about to change your name. God's about to mark your life. God's about to fulfill his promise and it is simply too precious for you to let go now. How many people give up before daybreak? How many believers get offended at the struggle and decide to go back to their old ways of living? How many Christians are moments away from transformation but don't stay engaged when the waves get wild. I love this. God wrestles with Jacob. He says, let me go. Not because God didn't have the power to snap his finger and automatically be released from Jacob's grip. But God is inviting Jacob to contend for the great value that he senses inside of him. And I love this. God tells Jacob, no longer will your name or identity be Jacob. From this moment forward, it will be Israel. <laughs> when Rebecca was pregnant, the angel of the Lord told her, you have two nations at war within your womb. Before Jacob was ever born, he was stamped with the destiny of a nation. There was conflict even in the womb. Esau came out first, but Jacob was right behind him, attached to his heel. There was conflict in his family system. His dad loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. There was conflict as it pertained to the family's inheritance. Jacob stole what wasn't rightfully his and ended up on the run, scared for his life. Jacob was not aware of the great destiny that he carried until this event. And all of a sudden, in this moment with God, Jacob has a revelation that would provide context for the conflict he had faced his entire life. The fight was never over Jacob. It was over the nation that he carried inside of him. And I want you to know, friend, the fight that you've been facing, the conflict that you have been waging, the blowback that you have been experiencing, it is not over you. It is over the destiny of a nation that you carry inside of you. And you simply must not give up until God does exactly what he's promised to do. I was thinking about it this week. Feels like every time we try to take a step for God, we get blowback coming from places that I didn't even know existed. We go open in Seattle, religious blowback. We're gonna do an Easter event, regional blowback. <laughs> I moved into a new house two weeks ago. It was new to me, but it's actually 15 years old. It's along a private drive. In the 15 year history of that house's existence, they have never once had a security issue, a break in or a theft until Friday night. Well, I'm sitting in my house, some Yahoo ran up on my porch, opened up the Christmas packages that got delivered by UPS 
and ran off with the contents inside their pocket. <laughs> and I thought to myself, God, why is nothing ever easy? <laughs> Why does it feel like every time we turn a, a new corner, the enemy comes in like a flood? God, it doesn't even make sense. And the Lord took me to Genesis 32 and said, Russell, you have misunderstood the nature of the battle that you are in. No, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers in high places. The enemy hates that you carry a nation inside of you and tries to sow seeds of frustration in an attempt to get you to give up. But I have made you more stubborn than the enemy is difficult. I have made you more persistent than the enemy is evil. And if you will contend, I will birth through your life what has always been inside of you from the moment of conception. Pursuit, there's a nation inside of you young man young woman there's a nation inside of you older man older woman there's a nation inside of you don't give up come on stay standing as we close I am convinced that what God is doing in this church is setting us up for national influence. Hear me, not for the sake of building our brand, not for the sake of growing our platform, but for the express purpose of seeing the nation come in to revival and reformation. Sometimes as a pastor, I feel like apologizing to our people every Sunday morning because by virtue of you standing in this room today, you are experiencing conflict that you didn't sign up for. Because the destiny that is on this house has so irritated the enemy that he's working overtime to pick you off. And I want you to know today, you might never realize the fullness of what God has planted inside of you, but I promise you this, you will live with regret if you give up in the middle of your nighttime struggle because although sadness and mourning may last for a night, there is joy that is coming when the sun rises for there is new mercies every day. Friend, it is well worth it for you to stay in the fight. When everything inside of you screams to give up, it is worth it to stay in the fight. When everything screams inside of you to go back, it is worth it to stay in the fight. When everything screams inside of you to give up hope, it is worth it to dream again, believe again, hope again, pray again. You were created for this because you've got a nation inside of you. But God, I just work at a drive through coffee shop. Great. You've got a nation inside of you. But God, I'm just sitting in my high school class, just taking classes to try to get ready for college. Great. You've got a nation inside of you. Never discount the day of small beginnings. God said it. We believe it. That settles it. And I will give the rest of my life to see a nation rebirthed for God's holy purposes. Let us be known as the church that wrestled with God and with men and we prevailed. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we ask for your help now in our time of need. God, I pray today that you would strengthen your people, strengthen your servants, 
strengthen your sons and daughters, that they would not give up in the midst of the struggle, that God, you would give them insight into the greatness and the value of the destiny that they carry. God, I thank you that you have not called us to a battle, that you are not equipping us to have victory in, for victory belongs to the Lord. And so God, today we position ourselves under your mighty hand and we know that you promote in due time. But God, give us the faithfulness, the endurance and the long suffering to not give up. So that what has laid residential inside of us could be birthed in the region around us. And God, we're going to give you all the praise and the glory and the honor for the great things that you have done. In Jesus' name, come on, all God's people said amen. And amen, friend, if you're here today.